Hi, we are uh, going to talk about DuckDuckGo. So, <laughs> so the main idea is to um, have a quick uh, recap on a basic problem in, um, in uh, systems level identification problems. So what do we mean by this? Uh, perhaps, let me see if I can make the video settings go to... Um, mm, this camera, right. So it's gonna be impossible to write on the board and see it now. Okay, well, because that camera should be on, should be normally visible. I think you have to plug in via USB-C for it to work. Uh, right, because this is just the display and yeah, this is usually, Yes, so my system is uh, from 2017, uh, starting out in containers uh, somewhere. <laughs> so it's an older system. So let's just continue. So basically, we have a problem uh, where we have a time series. So let's just imagine a time series, so it's time, and then we simply have a whole bunch of signals. So these are real value time series, say x1 of t, x2 of t, x3 of t, and so on. So index uh, one, two, and three are just indices of various sensors, okay? And T is actually time, so time is continuous, but of course you don't necessarily have measurements continuously in real time. You will have it up to certain time resolution. It could be millisecond, nanosecond, or just a second or a minute, and, and it doesn't matter, but it'll be some resolution. And the basic problem is, uh, the, the first elementary problem is we want to find a pathway to ingest all of these time series in, in, in a, say at the finest resolution of say milliseconds um, uh, into some sort of a distributed uh, file store that's uh, capable of uh, SQL and uh, other AI operations. So something like a Delta Lake, right? So that's the main idea. And to be able to do this, what we want to do is, um, uh, yeah, we should just finish this in 30 minutes. What we want to basically do is, um, you know, go to the domain experts and really understand what they are doing and find out if they have any particular lossless compression strategies and so on. And then uh, encode the data with the particular uh, possibly lossless comp compression into uh, a, a specific uh, um, bronze delta lake for, for that representation, right? So this is a standard type of thing you would do. You can, for example, have the data in say CSV files uh, and maybe a BZ2 zipped CSV files as the starting point. And then from there, you would simply use very standard, uh, say Spark or whatever ingestion operations. And then these things will end up in a, in a, in a, in a bronze or even a pre-bronze delta lake, let's say, just uh, zip CSV files. And then, and then from the sort of pre-bronzed uh, um, um, zip files, or, or sorry, uh, BZ2 files, or, or it could be TGC, uh, some open compression format. From there, you can simply use, a, you know, let's say a process like Kafka or much simpler, uh, say just Spark, and then you can start setting up a, a structured streaming job that simply looks in this directory. And every time a new file gets dropped, it will simply pump it into a, a sync um, where uh, you know, the sync basically is a, is a delta, delta lake, let's say at the bronze level, which is basically parquet files that are in a very nice column compressed format, right? So it's simply uh, in sort of Spark language, it just means writing data frames and data sets, right? Uh, so depending on, on how carefully this is done, uh, one should really set up uh, you know, maybe the ingestion could, should, should ideally be done in pure Scala. If it's, then it will be completely um, easy to debug and so on in the, in the ecosystem. And for that, you just need to know a little bit about Scala, like, you know, make some case classes, do some basic tests, and then flag, like, if there are, uh, you know, mistakes and things, you know, un unexpected cases and so on. So you could simply have that case class uh, you know, to, to create your data set, you know, Spark data set uh, by essentially reading these CSV files using a pure Spark.read operation, which will read all the CSV files, with multiple threads on multiple uh, hard drives on multiple machines in parallel. So then you can just simply read it and then 
uh, and then use the, the very simple Scala error handling uh, strategies to, uh, to turn them into, uh, into a case class, which basically says what's the type of the first column, what's the first column's name, what's the type of the second column, the second column's name, and so on. And then once you have that, you can simply pass that to a structured streaming job that will just uh, write it to, to the Delta Lake. Uh, or, 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 or you can just do it in a much simpler way, which would be easily streamable later, is simply take the, the CSV files with the Scala case class and just simply write as Delta tables. So this is just based something like write format Delta. That's the syntax for this, right? And then um, there are a few things we have to do. We may have to, um, you know, um, you know, optimize the delta table, but these are standard things you can quickly figure out. So the optimization is just dot optimize. What it'll do is because these files are written possibly in tiny chunks, it'll create the so-called small files problem because for big data, <laughs> the files are big, should be relatively big, each one, so that the metadata needed to store them is much smaller than the size of the data itself, but it shouldn't be too big. So there are some optimizations based on your hard drive and how things are read by the readers. Uh, so to, to combat the small files problem, where you just keep adding little rows and it'll explode, uh, the Spark basically goes in uh, with Delta, Delta, um, what is it? It's a Linux uh, open source project, Delta IO. Uh, they basically use Spark K to write the data, these column compressed uh, file format, but then they use JSON, uh, uh, you know, metadata basically to keep track of uh, what came in, what was deleted, when, and so on, so that you can do so-called ACID, asset transactions, autonomy, consistency, isolation, and uh, what is D? Um, something important for data science database people, okay? Um, so then uh, I think, yeah. So anyway, so, so the sort of asset compliance basically happens uh, uh, in the Delta IO using just uh, some, some JSONs, right? So you don't have to worry about all the details, but if you actually look at the data, you will start seeing JSON files and, uh, and Parquet files and so on. Okay, so what is this? At the end of the day, this is called a bronze Delta uh, lake of sensor one, okay? X1, right? So then we have uh, the bronze delta lake for sensor two and so on. And all these delta lakes should ideally be done with the finest resolution of the data the, the domain experts think are important. Uh, so say they, in some cases, a domain expert may actually already have done a possibly lossy compression. That means they are making some calls and actually losing the information in the data by making such calls. The calls could be, let me enclose it by some set, you know, some some, I don't know, say so it could be some, some cone or cube or some polynomial because you don't really know the analog fluctuations might be too detailed, you don't want it, and they may just enclose it. If they really believe that's enough, then that's fine because maybe all of the detailed analog signals at every millisecond for every sensor may just be too expensive. But if they do that, then that needs to be cleanly reported in the bronze level delta lake for that sensor, right? So, so that means your case classes now will actually be specifically designed for this representation. So why does this problem become complicated? Suppose you have uh, another, uh, you know, a target variable, say X, uh, I don't know, 674th one, you know, and the X 674th X variable is something of, of business value, you know, value for the product or, or whatever that's being um, created by this company, right? Uh, in, in, in its intended operation. So then this particular uh, um, time series um, uh, is, is going to somehow define or drive what we want to do with all the other sensor values. So it's basically, we can call this our target. Uh, the target need not be just one time series. It could actually be a, a possibly nonlinear function of multiple subset of time series of the full one. So, you, you know, so there's a lot going on and there's a few things like yield or whatever you want. You, you really want to target uh, and understand how that particular target time series, um, uh, you know, possibly, let's say we want to keep the target uh, to be very small because we've cast it as a minimization problem. So the target time series maybe should be ideally small below some threshold. And so we want to understand 
what is happening to the rest of the signals, uh, the rest of the time series, when this behaves as we wish it to behave, right? Say it's below a threshold or something. And that's kind of the basic problem of uh, full systems identification, you know, from a, from a very elementary point of view of optimizing a subset of the time series. Now, the, 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 the most important thing to be able to do this problem is we have to somehow at the silver level, which is the next stage of the delta table, uh, let's say at the silver level, what we want to do is to be able to join all these bronze time series with hopefully lossless compression, uh, you know, with efficient representations into a, a full blown, what is actually the value or the interpolated value with uh, a lot of tolerance uh, for the ignorance or actually uncertainty in the measurements. So, you know, however you do this, the most important point is now we need to be able to ask for any given millisecond, the finest resolution of time, any given millisecond, what is the value of the first time series? What is the value of the second and so on? These values themselves could be, you know, it doesn't have to be real numbers. They could be enclosures, right? They could be like intervals. These intervals could even be machine representable or not, or they could be integers. It doesn't matter. It can be, it can be a set, right? So you can say the value is somewhere in, inside here. Well, this is a standard thing everyone does, right? And of course, uh, that is the, the, the most difficult problem, I think, uh, just to, to resolve. Because if you can do that, then what have you done? You have created a silver level delta table that allows one to do arbitrary queries of any time interval in the past and get the exact value or its enclosure for every time series, including the target. Then it's just easy peasy lemon squeezy, right? Then you just do whatever you want. You, you know, you, you, if you're into some deep neural network, you can try that. Uh, but once that's done, you know, the, the, the sort of natural thing to do without like becoming too fancy is to apply a, a, a simple, you know, streaming k-means algorithm. You know, just, you know, k-means algorithm basically find, you, you set the number of clusters or, or you know, uh, or you can even, the, keep increasing their procedures decide when the cluster size is too big and so on. But let's say we take two, cl two clusters, K is two. And all we wanna do is to represent uh, big windows in time. Let's say, let's say this target variable that, that, that comes out of some process uh, happens to be of good value, whatever good means. Good means say it's below some threshold and, and bad means it's above some threshold. So you can basically use that. Uh, and then what you are interested in is, okay, I want to find just two clusters, but in the entire space of all time series, such that when I know that the, you know, the, the target time series is good and bad, because I can figure that out. I mean, I can view that. So is there any pattern basically is what you want to see, right? So you, you don't do anything. It's purely, uh, what is it called? Exploratory data analysis using just sort of, you know, pairwise distance-based learning, right? It's just for insights. Then the, the problem is because it's a time, so say it takes one day, for, for example, 24 hours, right? So that many milliseconds, say it takes, uh, uh, so we have to be aware of everything that's going in the system for the last one day to understand its possible effect on the target variable that's coming out, say, now. Then we need to know what all happened in the last 24 hours, let's say. The domain experts will know how far we should look back in the past and then simply take all the time series now and, uh, and simply you have to find some kind of a metric, a distance, pairwise distance between all the time series, right? So of course this problem <laughs> becomes quite, uh, quite complicated. Say if you have 6,000 or 10,000 time series, then every pairwise comparison for every time series at every point in time is what is it? Let's say thousand, thousand choose two, right? That's uh, so thousand choose two is what? Thousand times 999 divided by two. So that's 999 times 500. I mean, that's a lot. So, so we want to be aware that that kind of very detailed uh, behavior of every possible pairwise interaction, even ordered pairwise interaction. So now you put it in the matrix. So it's thousand by thousand. So you can have that's a million possible values for every time is really the full-blown measurable space. That's all we can see. 
Now, once we set that mathematical resolution, it's a, you can think of this as a sigma algebra if you want to think about it in a probabilistic way, or we can just leave it in the in the in the decision theoretic frame of uh, inference and in individual sequences, which means every single possible observation we want to be accounting for, right? So that's fine. So now the the problem is to, to induce the pairwise distances, we need to make some simplifications. So one of the natural simplifications is, okay, here is the whole day. Okay, I'm gonna take the whole day. And then I'm gonna maybe just do a dimensionality reduction of these time series, right? Because I can, I can for example, we can do all sorts of things. For, for simplicity of argument, let's say, I choose uh, uh, some, some set of points, say every hour, for example. And then I look at all the values, say maybe every minute even, look at all the values. And if they're enclosed, just go for the midpoint for now, just some representation. And then you simply, uh, so what is this? This is going to be just say, say 24 hours, say, say one for each hour, right? So there's 24 points. And for 24 of these time points, you have these, uh, these vectors, say like thousand, because they're a thousand time series, right? So then what you want to do is you can think of each of those thousand points at first time discretization and, and so as a point, as a bunch of points, basically how many, 24 points in a thousand dimensional uh, Euclidean real space. Okay, you can't visualize it, but nobody can, I think so. So then it's fine. But, but the point is because we can put these points in that space, we can now see what is maybe the pairwise distances between them for example, right? Uh, and if you want to sort of uh, look at it in a, in a slightly you know, more time sensitive way, you can actually take these, uh, you know, so these, these 24 points, and then you can actually take each time series and then find that it is represented by 24 points, right? So you can, you can also look at it in the time, in the time projection. So, and then another time series will have 24 points and so on. So then you can say, okay, there are these 1000 uh, measurement values in this time space of 24 dimensions. So, so then you put 1000 points in 24 dimensions. That's also fine. That's what we kind of maybe want to do, right? So either way, uh, let's say we do this, then you just simply hit it with the, with the k-means K algorithm, okay? Don't do anything, just see what happens with k equals two. Maybe something will be stupid, maybe not, but we have to do expert analysis and, and keep going further, right? But when if it provides two solid clusters, uh, it will, it's just a heuristic algorithm. It can completely be wrong, but most of the time if there's structure in the data, it finds it. So then we simply can say, aha, uh -huh, I'm gonna go and color my target variable, right? That there's an interest into say red and blue. Red is, okay, let's make red good and blue bad, right? Just for fun. So, the, so then, uh, so then we can we can then put those blues and reds on these points. Of course, there are other points, but you know there's thousands of them. But we can see if the if these specific red and blue points among this sort of thousand uh, points in 24 dimensions is going to be um, I don't know uh, is is it, is it going to be appear in, in all the reds will be in one cluster and all the blues in one cluster or not? I mean that's sort of the intuition. If that's the case, you can, you can iterate. So the next thing one could do is simply take this simple <laughs> representation and just do this pure streaming k-means. It's just right in, 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 in Spark, right? It's in the library, some, yeah. So then you do streaming k-means with some memory lag. So what is streaming k-means? You know, these two clusters will now start changing because you're using Spark streaming, structured streaming now, because that's how you wrote it. Then these clusters will just sort of wobble around. So every 20, so you just move through 24 hour windows, let's say over the last how many ever years you have and just make a movie, right? So you sort of see the things. And then we have to go back to domain experts and then ask, hey, what's this? And, 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 and because everything is nicely done in SQL, um, Spark SQL, you can just sort of, uh, yeah, just literally go back to what was the source that is, uh, you know, giving you this stuff. Then there are many other things we can do. We can start looking at, you know, okay, just 24 hours is maybe silly. Maybe we should, uh, maybe we should look at every minute, uh, for example. But that's not too bad, right? It's uh, and, and and K means is optimized with all its locality sensitive hashing and Z ordered curves, so it'll find pairwise distances super fast. We can kind of push the <laughs> limits of Spark on this uh, for fun. 
So now, okay, that 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 sort of gives some insight. So next is, uh, so I guess we have roughly 10 minutes left. That should be enough. So the next main thing is we are going to, um, what is uh, the point? Yes. So we can do other things now. All right. Maybe we say k-means is great, but I actually want to be a, a bit more, I want to actually look at the redu reduction, reduced dimensions. So uh, that somehow uh, save the structure, uh, right? So you can do a singular value decomposition, uh, for example, that are very, very powerful uh, algorithms, distributed algorithms for SVD in, in, in Spark and Malib, and there are other, other, other practice you can check out. So then, um, yeah, you could try SVD and you could do basically a moving SVD, right? So singular value decomposition, what does it do? It basically takes a matrix, and uh, represents it by three other matrices, right? Uh, one, you know, so the, so the one in the middle has these sort of, um, you know, eigenvalue decomposition, and then this is the left eigenvectors and the right eigenvectors, right? Um, so you can, I think a lot of this is done in the second module in, 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 in Scaramalli, I believe, uh, parts of it anyway. Uh, so then you can basically look at SVD and there are many other things, you know, people have looked at robust PCA and PCA principal component analysis. So you should try PCA and then SVD because PCA is much more standard thing to do first. Uh, and, and, and what is, so then, you know, you, in, in SVD say you can choose the, the rank of the inner matrix. So the, that is the, 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 the approximating dimension in some sense. So by, by choosing some, some appropriate rank and increasing the rank slowly, you can approximate the original ma the data matrix, right? So now you again have to figure out what should the data matrix that we're approximating be, right? Again, yeah, you, can, you can, yeah, either do it, uh, uh, yeah, uh, you can just take time points and then for each time point, you know, say 24 hours, you can have 1000 things. So you'll basically have a, you know, 1000 by 24 matrix, for example, so if you have 1,000 by 24 matrix, that's uh, that's definitely uh, within the tall skinny paradigm. So you can so so that's uh, those are some papers on on. Um, so yeah, let me just give you some things here. So we you know you just sort of know where to jump in. So so basically um, we can go here. And um, right, so this is essentially um, so come to here. So um, so quickly walk through this. So I, I we have time, so I will walk through the code in a bit, where, where to look at and how this gets started. But before that, let me finish the story here, the mathematical story. So. Now we, we have, uh, so we, we can have like chunks of time, say one day or whatever. And as chunks of time are moving, for example, as a, as a moving window. So this is not like a partition of time. We're actually sliding the window. Then we can actually look at what's, uh, what's happening to the singular value decomposition, uh, basically approximating it by uh, as a smaller matrix and then start visualizing that, right? To visualize that there are a lot of tools uh, like TensorBoard and all sorts of things. I wouldn't go too much into it because that's uh, that can be done. We can show the domain experts how to interact with it quickly, but uh, that'll that'll give some insights on on how the data is structured in this low dimensional space. What are the you know the, the main uh, dimensions that are having a lot of uh, signals and variance? So the next thing to do after say PCA SVD, so K means PCA SVD, then the next uh, natural thing to do would be. Well, I actually want to go all out now, maybe, and say I'm going to create a, a, a you know a non-linear because the problem with SVD and PCA is that they're linear dimensionality reduction operations. They just use pure linear algebraic operations. Um, but I want to actually maybe look at a non-linear dimensionality reduction, right? So you know things that are in very complex manifolds or who knows what could actually uh, be possibly learned using uh, our sort of standard missionary, right, called neural networks. So they're just function approximators in high dimensional spaces. So what is the basic technology for this? Uh, it's, it's called auto encoder. It encodes itself. Mathematically, it's approximating the identity function. Right? If, if I pass something into it, the same thing comes out. That's what it is, right? 
So the, 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 uh, the, the identity function we want to pass in is the entire time series itself. And we want to train the autoencoder so it actually produces what was put in by itself, right? So we learn the weights. There's no biggie. So that's, uh, and, then, and then we can turn that in, in many ways. We can use that learned autoencoder in many, many ways. One natural way is uh, called, uh, I don't want to use this word, but, but let's use it. Uh, actually, I'm going to do it in a, in a careful way. So we are going to possibly uh, look at uh, some other metric. You know, so this is autoencoder, it's doing something. And then there is another thing that sort of uh, looks at uh, some sketch. So I'll get into what a sketch is. Uh, and you should get into apachesketches.org at some point. I'll show you, but basically a sketch keeps track of something in the, in the, uh, something that's happening to this autoencoder as data has, uh, has been trained and it passes through it and, and then new data comes in and, and, uh, and the autoencoder sometimes produces output that is very, not really like the input. And then we can basically turn that into a sketch. Um, so sketch essentially, monitors the whole process as the data is going through the autoencoder and the inputs and outputs are coming. The sketch is going to keep track of how did it do all the way from the beginning up to now. So then it'll, it, for example, it can keep track of say some kind of a score of interest, right? That tells us, the score tells us something about what's happening to the system at the system's level uh, based on the autoencoder not being able to uh, identify the input to the output. Right. So it's very general uh, and we can do that. Um, and then the simplest example could be uh, looking at the, the lower and upper percentile values of the sketch. So what is the, the, the lowest 0, 0.0 whatever one you know, event and what is the, you know, what are these sort of 99.9 .9 percentile events, right? Because those are going to be, uh, you know, so if the score somehow goes uh, outside the range, then they are sort of interesting to, to note, right? So then we want to maybe sort of flag the ourselves or the domain expert and say, hey, is this something going on? Did somebody like, I don't know, lose a leg in the, in the machine process that they shut down the machine? You know, it could be things like that. So, uh, so that's kind of the idea. And, and this is, you know, for certain types of scores, this becomes a problem of anomaly detection. But, but the mathematical generality is that you can actually create sketches of different types so that that sketch and the kind of score it induces can also keep track of other things, you know, uh, can say, hey, this is actually uh, the sort of optimal, it, it's, you know, the score is in this optimal regime because uh, the, the target variable is exactly like how we like it. And then, um, and then you can actually go back and, and, and mark the time intervals when this behaves like this and then see you know, how the autoencoder has behaved and actually go back to the source data. So the, the domain experts say, hey, this is really what's going on in your system when you have this optimal thing. And by the way, this is what's going on in your system when we have extremely suboptimal things. I'm sure you know what's going on, right? Because the domain experts will know this. So it's mostly a way for us to, uh, yeah. And of course, this process hopefully can can you know help with sort of understanding uh, the behavior of the system um, much better. So that's it. That's kind of the main idea. It seems like a lot, right? But it's the hard work is actually building the bronze bronze table. Silver is a bit more difficult, but it's possible. So when you build the bronze, you have to already think about how the silver should come come about. Then all these other things I told you, right? The auto encoder, all of that, you can, whatever you can see, you can just sort of sell them as sell gold and platinum and diamond. I, I don't want to go into this terminology. It's probably going to die anyway soon. But the idea is that there are stages of data cleaning and then uh, some, some more and more value comes out. So, so here, how do you go and do this? So here is basically, uh, so you can always look at this book link. So this is the Scatamali course pathways. I talked about this at, uh, yesterday at uh, the Databricks University Alliance thingy. Um, so here is like a, a particular lowdown for a particular class of problems of system identification. So um, yes, so I, I just went to the first module. So the first module simply is like this. I mean, this is just a, a MD book of it. So it just runs on your own system. And you can search things. So, you know, it starts with a Scala crash course, for example. So 
Uh, you don't need to know all of Scala, but the more you know, of course, the better. And there's quite a lot of resources you can start, right? So you can sort of start with Scala. The reason we really want to use Scala is because we want to do Python later. <laughs> But if you start doing things in Python, I think it'll be very difficult to do multi-languages. Uh, and it's so much easier to pay a human to learn Scala than fight the, the sort of coding habits we sort of bury ourselves into in the future, right? And this is just for the Spark ecosystem. Of course, if you use a different framework like, like Ray, then it's a different story, right? So it's just, so yes, uh, I don't want to go through all of this. Uh, this sort of, you can learn. It's uh, the contents can, you can just download like this put it into your community, you know, uh, yeah, just download and then just upload into the community edition. Databricks is getting harder and harder to find. Uh, but yeah, it's the free version of Databricks that you can, uh, anyone can subscribe to. So each of these packs can be uploaded there and you can learn there. That's the idea. So then once you've done the learning, so let's say in this one, we have, um, why Spark, Scala, and then the basics, like what is an RDD, transformations and actions, there's a little bit of homework, it's mostly just reading stuff. Um, and, um, and then you can, maybe I should also, while we are here, maybe I should do, uh, um, uh, right, so I will show this, uh, this particular shot that, uh, I mean, you can do this in the community edition, but I don't want to log into the community edition at the moment to save time because we're sort of really running low on time now. Um, so basically you can upload, uh, you can create a folder called scalable data science at the workspace level because some of backward compatibility, scalable minus data minus science, let's say. And then inside this directory, you can simply go like this and then go import and then choose the, you know, browse and find the DBC archive you downloaded, right? You can just from your system. So you download and then you upload, right? So then uh, I don't wanna, uh, let's see. So, so here is the, the, the actual notebooks, right? So you can say the Scala crash course ones here. So you can actually do as you learn and learn as you do, right? <laughs> so the point. So it's not a lecture, it's not a lab, it's a self tutorial, it's everything, right? So you, you, you teach yourself basically. And, uh, and there's a lot of resources here. So you can just go into a cell and then you know, just run it or control enter or shift enter. And you can, you know, you can just start a cluster by going here. So in community edition, you can just go and start a cluster and attach the notebook to the cluster. I'm not gonna do all of this now. Um, so let's say we go to uh, workspace. Uh, and I wanna show you, uh, there's a yeah, crash course, RDD, Spark SQL. So once we get into, so, so Spark Core is there and then there are various libraries built around Spark Core. So Spark SQL is most important for extract load transform operations. So you learn Spark SQL. What I've done is just basically taken the entire programming guide and then just put it back in Databricks. So it's all open information, uh, anyone can use it. You can use any of this information and make money if you want, wherever you are, you don't have to pay me anything. So it's completely open. Um, there is Pivot SQL and other things like this, right? So then we get into Diamonds Pipeline. So now we're getting into how to take this Diamonds data. It's a simple one everyone sees in our courses. Uh, and then we make a ETL pipeline, ex extract load transform. And I don't wanna go into this now. There are videos of myself babbling on this a couple of years ago on YouTube, but I, it's not worth it, you know? Then we look at this power pipeline example where you sort of have, you know, the first four steps, business understanding, load your data, explore your data, visualize your data. So that's kind of the lowdown I gave for this much more difficult problem of system identification, right? Time, you know, in time uh, uh, over lots of sensors. But this one's a, it's kind of similar, but it uses linear regression and, and, and thing. Of course, it's important to use genetic regression, G11. And if you use the Spark framework in the right way, they're all simply, you know, once you get once you get going, it's it's basically just making a call. And here I should, you should show you how to do linear regression. We also later on go in, in tuning and evaluation that come later. We actually look at uh, a random forest model, I think, and then compare linear regression with random forests. So you can do like you know different families of models, the optimal ones, and then actually compare them using a machine learning pipeline. So follow those steps, it should work. And if something is broken, cause things always evolve, then, you know, just kindly, uh, yeah, fix it, you know. 
So um, yeah, this one's uh, yeah some some other things with Wikipedia click streams. Uh, the next one is here. Um, what we want here is um, so it gives you introduction to packaging package cells because what you want to do you definitely don't want to lock yourself into uh, notebook coding habits uh, that can degenerate yourself in time. Right. So what I mean by notebooks are great because they allow you to do interactive exploration very fast. They use the REPL loop in a web browser, right? The read, evaluate, print loop. That's what you do when you do Spark Shell. You should always, always download Spark and play it locally. Uh, I would also, I would also Git clone <laughs> Apache uh, uh, Spark, you know? Uh, just, just download the entire source code for Spark because you can just quickly look through your own system and find what's going on instead of Googling all the time. And when you Google all the time, you need to, you know, maybe clear your cookies and stuff because Google is trying to optimize what it thinks you want. And so it's much better to just download the source code. So anyway, uh, in the interest of time, here is unsupervised clustering with k-means with the one million song example. And then uh, I don't think I have the, the streaming k-means, but I think there are links to streaming k-means, some videos from, from the past. Uh, there is also like, um, yeah, some other things with handwritten digit recognition on supervised clustering, uh, supervised uh, learning, basically. And um, and then it gives you a basic quick crash course on linear algebra. Some of the videos are busted, unfortunately. Uh, AJ from uh, UCLA, um, uh, yeah, and uh, Amita Larker, they promised me that the videos will be under YouTube license, but, uh, but it was our on a course done by edX and then uh, edX is only supposed to own the package content and they supposedly own the video, but now the videos have gone private. I will make my own videos when I actually deliver the course in March, but for now you, you, you can figure it out in Khan Academy, so I'll embed Khan Academy stuff later. So anyway, this is linear algebra, distributed linear algebra. There are papers there. You should definitely read one of the main papers in, in distributed linear algebra. I can actually go here for you want and make sure yeah, these videos are unfortunately busted. But I think this is the main reference for uh, distributed linear algebra as far as I know. Uh, yes, matrix computation and optimization in Apache Spark. So you kind of have some idea of, you know, what is SVD? What's going on? What's matrix? What is a row vector? What's a row matrix, index row matrix, coordinate matrix, block matrix? I mean, it seems like, oh my God, I have to learn all this. No, okay, you have to know a little bit. Otherwise, you're going to, you know, not use what was done by very clever people. So here is a SVD, you know, and there's an AR pack, and it tells you how it's doing SVD in a very simple way. So I would definitely read that. And as we are doing this, yeah, unfortunately, when you click like this in Databricks, the link, you're supposed to right click and open in the new tab. <laughs> so what I did was bad because you don't want to go back and forth like this, especially depending on your network. So you should really open link in new window or new tab. Okay. Uh, that's what I should have done and stay here, right? Um, so anyway, I think this is a bunch of notes from when I myself studied this uh, a while back. Yeah, so this you can, yeah, this is for more theoretical stuff, definitely not for the problem we want to solve. Um, so then, yeah, it just goes through local vector, label point, local. These are all just Spark data structures in, in a machine learning library. And a loop. So we don't want to roll our own. We do not want to go and take some Python library or R library because we learned that in a course and that's not the universe, okay? No, that's not, that is part of some universe, but in this Spark ecosystem universe, you wanna use the Spark core, the machine learning library, Spark SQL, because it's built in a very careful way for fault tolerance using linear graphs and stuff, stuff like that. Having said that, Python is super important. So there's a whole bunch of stuff we will come back to. So here you're basically learning, yeah, so this is about, uh, so some of these things I think you can read. So that's module two, right? So that's basically here, this is module two. So it quickly, if you hover over, it tells you the various things that it covers. Okay. Yeah, you can skip this. This is uh, structured, uh, this is Spark streaming. Definitely for this, we want structured streaming. So you can go here. So that's kind of the path where I would do. So uh, for this problem, one, two, three, and uh, you, you don't need to worry about privacy, I think. <laughs> the sensors are not people yet. And then, uh, yes, and then if you, if you want to get into autoencoders, uh, so I would do one, two, uh, four, and then that'll give you a lot of streaming, structured streaming, and so on. And then you can get into autoencoders. 
Okay, so there you have to do this is triple zero six or just catch up on it because most of you probably know a lot of deep learning, single machine stuff, that's all good. So here toward the end, uh, there is auto encoders, but please go through all the notebooks in sequence because prerequisite knowledge is atomically building in this, you know, so in the, in the, in the, in the graph, okay? So you, you have to go through the notebooks from starting first to the second and so on. And then within each notebook, you have to start from the top and go down, right? Because so the execution order in the cells matter. So my point earlier is we definitely want to be able to uh, write code in such a way, like for, for example, follow the examples and package cells so that when we actually do something that is very good and modularized in the notebook, we prototype, then we want to hopefully absorb it into a library. <laughs> Right, and that's not too difficult to do. It just uh, it, you need to learn a little bit about how to use Docker and and uh, Spark. So you can, for example, um, we can go to GitHub.com. I mean, this is kind of a low role um, Docker dev. So this is just stuff we've been doing in Uppsala, the Columbian Competence Center. Just uh, very low level Docker containers. So you have a lot of Docker containers. Um, it's sort of the readme is detailed, so you should probably do a little tutorial in Docker. And then we use various Spark uh, Docker containers like 3x and 2x. I just fix some things bo broken, bin tray was broken, a bunch of things, but this is a continuously evolving thing, right? Um, so I would use like say Docker 3x um, Pi. Um, the, the latest one I think is it has Python 3 and, uh, and the entire build process for making libraries using Maven or SBT, uh, right? And uh, there's a lot of details here. So you can kind of, you know, yeah, you can sort of um, modularize code. And, and, and then there are a lot of links to various other uh, libraries here you can look at for inspiration, um, mostly the Spark ones. Like say, for example, the Spark GDELT one. Um, so that's Antoine's, that's uh, slightly, uh, a sync now. So, you know, it's sort of here we parse all of the world's data, metadata. And if you basically look at source, that is main and test. So it's really some resources here for like, like data sets we want to test things on. And then mainly it's say Scala, uh, GDELT. And if you kind of look at it, there's only three files. So it's just the way you have to structure it is slightly different when we modularize it. So when we are happy with something, we basically pack it, right? Uh, so that's kind of, but notebooks are also extremely important at the same time. So in the end, uh, in the interest of time, because I have to go to a meeting in two minutes, uh, we are going to uh, next do this. So, uh, and, then, and then distributed deep learning. And this is uh, essentially builds on how do you use a big cluster? The data is too big because these auto encoders are going to be massive. <laughs> so we want to, you know, learn that and and th and that's it so you learn about autoencoders here and then go here then you learn about uh, a little bit of algebra svd and stuff here uh, extract load transform low level stuff here and then structured stream okay so that's basically it i believe um and and on sketches uh you know i i think uh, that there is something on sketches here as well you can chase there's uh, stuff about uh, a simple sketch and there are links to Apache sketches, uh, data sketches, Apache org and stuff there. There are some videos from the last summit that I was absorbing. Um, so that's a bunch of stuff. The last final thing I wanna say is that uh, if, if the system is critical, uh, that means if mistakes can be dangerous for humans or whatever, then uh, there is a class of, of, of algorithms, so it's a type of sketches one can use to do rigorous arithmetics and so on with enclosures. So this whole architecture I've explained to you is, 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 is rich enough and tight enough, like representation-wise, that we could potentially do enclosure sketches in the future, right? Not, for, not, for, not necessarily for the current problem, but it should be thought about in a careful way so that we can actually enclose the data with say boxes and, and use tree arithmetics to partition and things like this. So, uh, so for example, you can basically follow some of these things. I will point out uh, in one second, um, if I can get here. 
because we have another parallel project where we're working on this. Uh, yeah, you can see all the random stuff I've been using things I, I want to I see. So what I wanted to show you is here. It's this one. So it's actually from a uh, cool landing with their code trajectories. Okay, I know. So it's basically I'm talking about uh, weather data and air traffic code trajectories and representations of enclosures of airplanes of the specific IDs and. So the point is there is actually a whole class of sketching methods that are endowed with arithmetic operations. So you can overlay code trajectories uh, and things like this. So you, here we have a time series of code trajectories that are much, much simpler because you only have one dimension they vary in, but there are lots of them. Here, this is arithmetic of code trajectories where flights are changing altitude, latitude, and longitude, and all the code trajectories of the pilots that are landing on top of Atlanta, Georgia uh, are, are having some collective intelligence decisions that they're making along with support from the air traffic controllers that specifically depends on the exact wind speeds and weather patterns and thunderstorms on, on Georgia, right? So it's kind of the same problem. So I recommend sort of watching this video a little bit so to, to make more sense of what I meant, but in a much more precise setting. So we're out of time. Uh, ciao.